Haven't talked a lot of new music, have we lately, kids? Well, we're going to do that today, all right? Going to talk new music, going to talk some sports, going to talk about my relentless social media and phone addiction. This is an hour of consummate entertainment for you, the listening public, and we'll get to it on the other side. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I've just been listening to something new. Like, literally, something new. A song called Something New. I was just on YouTube, literally seconds, minute tops, before I turned on the old recording device to begin talking at myself. Now, I was going through some stuff on YouTube that I know has been released within the last week or so. So I was just checking it out, going over it again, and we'll talk about some of it. And the YouTube algorithm, such as it is, the all-knowing, all-seeing YouTube algorithm, recommended to me something that I've never heard of before, and it's this artist from Deutschland called... Martin Miller. Anybody out there familiar with Martin Miller? Until about 10 minutes ago, I had never heard of Martin Miller, okay? But I'm looking at the side of the YouTube feed there, and there's this recommendation. And it's like there's a thumbnail on this video, and it's a guitar, because I've been watching some guitar rock. Remember guitar rock? I've been watching some guitar rock, and so this recommendation on the other side is a guitar rock song, evidently. So just on a whim, you know, sometimes you feel an intuition because, you know, YouTube is throwing up recommendations all the freaking time. And my observation over the past few weeks is that YouTube is every bit as addictive as Instagram or TikTok or any of the other social media apps that just keep pulling you in with this algorithm that keeps throwing up new content at you. And, you know, I've been trying to be a little bit mindful about my social media usage, which is becoming an issue again. And I don't know if you want me to talk about that anymore, but I find myself just catch myself doom scrolling regularly again, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And it's partly out of boredom and it's partly out of avoiding the feelings of boredom. And there's a whole deep psychological angle to this you know, why we doom scroll, what we're doing in place of avoiding perhaps uncomfortable things. And, you know, I got some uncomfortable things these days as I try to sort out my freaking life in this post-pandemic world. Maybe you can relate. YouTube, you know, I've distanced myself somewhat. I almost never go on TikTok. I post one, tops two podcast plugs a week on the TikTok, and I just let them do their thing. And I'm trying to curb the Instagram. It is so powerful. It is so powerful, especially when you are avoiding, and I must be avoiding because I'm on there all the freaking time. Facebook, I don't spend a lot of time on, particularly my personal feed. I almost never post on my personal Facebook feed unless there's a show to promote something like that, and I do that usually as an act of faith or a courtesy to the artist I'm performing with, trying to do my bit, you know. I do spend a bit of time on my Facebook podcast page because that needs to be somewhat active. There needs to be some engagement there. But generally speaking, I've been doing a good job of not being on Facebook and doing a good job of not being on TikTok. Instagram I wrestle with because there's something about that app that I like It's very easy to keep scrolling, and it's something that I'm trying to be aware of. And so, you know, I'm avoiding those things and going over to YouTube, and then I catch myself over the past week or two, realizing that I am performing exactly the same behavior on YouTube as I do on the others. (laughs) Different versions of doom scrolling. I suppose the one saving grace about YouTube is that it tends to be longer form content. All right. So it's not 
this relentless 5, 10, 15 second bursts that just keep going, going, going like a freaking slot machine. Incidentally, I've said this before, and I understand it's true. You know, these apps have been designed like slot machines to reward you intermittently for pulling the freaking handle, you know, swipe up, swipe down, whatever. This is the motion of a slot machine, you know, just keep hitting that button. And once in a while you get a reward. I mean, this is psychology as old as they've been studying psychology and it works. Pull, 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 get frustrated. Then bam, something hits dopamine, the whole dang thing. It is an addictive cycle. They have employed people who work in casinos to work on these apps, how they function, how they reward you to keep your butt, theoretically, to keep your butt sitting in the chair, just like they do at casinos. Keep them sitting here, keep them pumping in that money. Once in a while, give a little bit back, make them feel like a winner. And then, you know, just keep them in the chair. And before they know it, 48 hours has gone by because it's always daytime in the freaking casino, right? There are places in Vegas where you walk down a street or a corridor and this, it's, it's encased, it's enclosed. You, know, you look up and there's a roof on the street and there's like clouds and blue sky painted up there. Oh yeah, man, it's a whole freaking scene. I realized I'm doing exactly the same thing on YouTube as I do on the other apps. Again, the saving grace is it's somewhat longer content. So I might be listening to a 15 minute or 20 minute or 45 minute lecture, presentation, whatever, might just be football coverage. And let me freaking tell you, as the saga of Arsenal's 22-23 Premier League season continues, there is a lot of that content, content to consume, man. On the weekend, Arsenal's home to Bournemouth. Bournemouth is fighting relegation. This should be a walkover, but it's never a walkover against a team fighting relegation, okay? Relegation is catastrophe. To be avoided, tooth and nail, at all freaking costs. Now, Arsenal goes into this game with a five-point lead on Man City, the evil empire that is Man City. And before Arsenal kicks off, City wins their game, cuts that lead to two freaking points. And there's a world out there. There's two worlds out there. Maybe they mingle, maybe they combine. One world is desperate for Arsenal to win this league at Man City's expense because they are sick of Man City and their petrodollars and their limitless resources and how they have just dominated the freaking league since all that money came into the side, right? Even if you're not an Arsenal fan, barring perhaps you Spur fans out there, Spurs fans, and there's 10 or 12, I'm not sure. Most of the world wants Arsenal to win this thing at City's expense, okay? But there's another world out there that's just looking at their watch, waiting for the Arsenal collapse to come. <laughs> waiting for the youngest team in the Premier League, who's not supposed to be at the top of the table this late in the season, to finally have the wheels come off and slide back down the table so City can ascend yet again to the freaking title. And those two camps can overlap, all right? Some who still want it, but fear the worst. And among those are counted many Arsenal fans who have lived through now, you know, a generation or more of mediocre results, heartbreak, crisis. But there is a unity in the side amongst the fans, amongst the team, amongst everything that is beyond anything I've seen. As an Arsenal supporter, low these many freaking years, I've never seen cohesion like this. And I've never experienced, at least in the football world, this level of freaking intensity, man. And we have seen it repeatedly and recently. Arsenal with these dramatic last second comeback wins. I'm doing the airplane around my basement as a last second goal goes in and they win again. And, you know, engaging with fan media that didn't exist 10 years ago, whatever. Like there's this new level of being into and involved in your team. It is a relentless 24-hour stream of freaking content. And when your team is in this position, 
of potentially winning the thing for the first time in 20 years against all freaking odds and these extraordinarily dramatic situations keep happening, it's just like getting punched around, man. <laughs> it's wild. So Arsenal's seen their lead cut to two points that morning. They're about to kick off against Bournemouth. They're supposed to beat Bournemouth. They're at the opposite ends of the table. There should not be a competition here. But in the Premier League, there are no gimmies anymore, my friends. And so the game kicks off. Bournemouth kicks off. Literally, literally nine seconds, Bournemouth freaking scores. It's the second fastest goal in Premier League history. And you're like, what? You're like, what was that? They literally kicked off, went down the pitch, and scored. Like, that's not supposed to happen. And then the game took on from there the character that was mostly expected. All right, first half of the match, Arsenal has something to the effect of 85% of possession. <laughs> that is extraordinary, man. Arsenal had the ball at their feet 85% of the freaking time. And they just can't get through. All right, what teams do against Arsenal is they come in, generally speaking, they sit in a low block. They park the bus. For you hockey fans, it's the freaking trap. They defend, 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 defend. And the game is you try to defend and then hope to get lucky on a counterattack, score a goal, right? Or a set piece or a corner or win a penalty somehow if you ever have the ball in Arsenal's box. Bournemouth's already done the hard work. They scored nine seconds in. Now they can just defend for the rest of the game. And so it's this siege mentality. And Arsenal's all over them, all over them, all over them. Cannot pick the freaking lock. Cannot find their way through. Had a couple penalty shouts, were turned down. Don't get me started. They go into halftime all over this team and just cannot break through. And it's maddening, you know, because every possession turns into an attack. And you're like, is this it? Is this it? Is this it? But we've seen this before. We have seen before the team, particularly in previous seasons, really struggle to unlock a tight, compact, diligent defense. And that's what we're facing. Can't get through, can't get through. And you're starting to think, it's going to be one of these games. Is it going to be one of these freaking games that we're supposed to win and we just can't find the way through? Second half kicks off. Play, 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 play. Same thing. Bournemouth finally wins their first freaking corner of the match. Arsenal had 17 corners, I think, in this match. Bournemouth finally gets a corner, which means they actually got towards Arsenal's net for a change. Don't they score off the corner? And you're like, it is. It is one of these games where we're all freaking over them, cannot score, they get two chances and win the game. And so it's 2-0, and it's looking freaking grim, all right? But... The band plays on, and that's the thing about the character of this very young side. They just don't freaking quit. They are relentless, and they get a goal back, and then they get another goal back, and then the tide is turning, and the intensity around the stadium is freaking mad, all right? This roller coaster. The highs have been real high, but the nail biting, you know, you watch your team on a playoff run in hockey because I think that's where most of us connect here, the listeners of this program. Yeah, the playoff run is, it can be a, like a couple of months. Like it goes on, no question about it. But there are no playoffs in the Premier League. So effectively, if you're going to win this thing, your playoffs start on opening day. So if you can imagine eight months of this level of high and low and this intensity, and then you add into it, how long it's been for this club, how rough it has been for this club to try to compete against these increasingly mega-rich giant clubs. And it's been so hard, and I will not go into the last 20 years of Arsenal, how difficult it's been. And then to see this team rising from those ashes, the youngest team, and to watch this week in and week out, the highs and lows are very high very low. So it's 2-2, and doesn't my app conk out at that point? So actually, my app may have, it may have dropped out at 2-0. I'm not sure. I think they did. They scored on the corner. It's 2-0, and I'm like beginning to lose my mind, and I think my app conked out. And so, you know, I'm catching up online. It's 2-2. 
Then there was like some snow. There was a thing. There was a thing that happened and I had to go outside and deal with it. And so I missed this in real time. But here's what happens, all right? A, from the second they score that goal, Bournemouth starts wasting time. That's a thing in the game. Time wasting, taking as long as you can to take a free kick or a goal kick or whatever. It's freaking maddening. Drives me and everybody else freaking nuts. But that's the game. You know, no one ever said... No one ever accused footballers of real great integrity. <laughs> All right, let's not go there. They've been wasting time all freaking game. And then we get, it's 2-2, it's the 90th minute, whatever. 91st, 92nd, they call for six minutes of injury time. All right, okay, that gives us a glimpse because, you know, Arsenal remains all over this freaking team. 30 shots, like all over them. Trying, once they got to 2-2, it's like, we're gonna, we can go for a win here. We can turn this around and win it, man. 92nd minute, 93rd minute, Bournemouth player goes down. Oh, I'm injured. Oh, I'm injured. Rolls around for 30 or 40 seconds, then jumps up and trots away. You know, you've seen this crap before, and it's a real blight on the freaking game. So they add that time on, though. Kudos to the referee. The referee says, I saw you waste that time. We're adding it on. So it's supposed to be six minutes of extra time. We roll over the six minute. Arsenal's got chances, got chances, got chances, cannot break through, cannot break through. And every time they get a shot and miss, you think, well, that's it. They're going to blow the whistle game over. Is this a point gained or two points lost? And the consternation will begin. But they get one more shot, gets tipped out for a corner. And you think, well, this has got to be it, right? This has got to be it. Everything that's at stake, coming back from 2-0 down, the whole thing. They take up, they set up, take the corner, comes into the box. Keeper punches, the ball drops to, of all people, Reese Nelson, who's barely had a kick all season. He's been injured. He is an academy product who was tipped for big things and has never quite worked it out. Could very easily have been sold or been on loan this year. You know, not supposed to be part of it. Just coming off injury. Not even supposed to be on the pitch. He's only in the side because somebody else got injured and didn't make the starting lineup. But here comes the ball dropping to Reese Nelson on his wrong foot, on his weak foot, with the last kick of the game. And he just freaking smashes it at the net and doesn't it sail right in. And I've never seen, I've never seen a stadium erupt like that. And had I been able to watch it in real freaking time, it would have been more airplanes around my basement. The level of intensity is just freaking beyond if you have ever seen your team in the Stanley Cup final pulling out a winner in overtime that kind of thing imagine a whole season of games with that much at stake with that much freaking intensity and the further we go in this season it's like a dozen games left the closer they inch toward this unlikely title and you begin to realize man that's what this is all about and so there is just this wild intensity about it. And I don't know if I can take much more of it. You know, you watch the fan media, you listen to the fan media, people are like, this is amazing. And I can't take it. <laughs> What's it like for the players? It's absolutely freaking dynamite. And then the next day to watch Manchester United lose 7-0 <laughs> at Liverpool just adds that little cherry on top even if you hate Liverpool. <laughs> if you hate Liverpool, you probably hate United more. Just saying. And so I've been watching a lot of football content. All this to say, I'm spending a lot of time on YouTube. And yeah, a lot of it's been football content because this Arsenal season is extraordinary. And if you are a fan, as I am, and you're tapped in to other fans around the world, and the technology of the day allows you to do that, in ways that you never could 10 years ago or 15 years ago. You can be part of it. And you get swept up in what is a level of intensity that I don't think I've ever felt in sport. And I've watched the Canadians win the cup twice. I've watched them lose a couple of finals. It's weird when the Habs used to win the cup because you kind of half expect it. That's how spoiled Habs fans are. Like there was a period of decades where they never went more than seven years without the cup becomes kind of routine, you know? If Toronto ever wins the cup, I feel awkward even saying that because I'll have to leave the freaking country. I guess 
that level of intensity could be there, but only through four playoff rounds, not through eight freaking months of this grind. So I'm watching a lot of that on YouTube. And I want to say that it's more edifying than 15 second clips on TikTok or Instagram or whatever. And I'm watching YouTube and I'm watching a lot of motivational stuff and I'm watching self improvement stuff and I'm watching stuff about spirituality. So there's a level of edification, I guess, in the scrolling that I'm doing on YouTube, but I'm recognizing that I'm just replacing one addiction with another. It remains my head being very clouded with noise, just relentless noise, whether it's a scroll on Instagram and those dopamine shots or whether it's longer scrolls on YouTube, which still is filling my head with noise. And that is an avoidance technique. I recognize this as that. Partly it's an addiction, partly it's a tactile addiction with the social media. And it's not just a social media addiction, it's a phone addiction, right? Like how can you go sit through a whole movie without picking up your freaking phone? Hard to do, man. Like I had to set parameters. Like I cannot pick up my phone during a half of football. Can you wait 45, maybe 50 minutes to pick up your phone? It's like for a lot of people, the first thing they do in the morning, last thing they do at, the, in, at nighttime, and they're holding this thing in their freaking hand. And then there's stuff on it that they interact with, but it's like a phone addiction as much as it's an app addiction, you know? And it is ultimately a distraction, you know? And these apps get paid by your attention. Attention is the new freaking currency, right? And then you've got all the people who are on the apps trying to get your attention because that's currency too. And to a certain extent, I'm guilty of that because I'm trying to grow an audience for this podcast. And then you go down these weird kind of Escher rabbit holes. Look up Escher's art. You'll see what I mean. Of Am I part of the problem or part of the freaking solution, man? <laughs> but I noticed that even if I get away from using your traditional social media apps, I find myself scrolling on YouTube and I have to reckon with that. I have to decide, you know, am I avoiding feeling things? Am I avoiding thinking about things? Is it just another replacement addiction? But once in a while, YouTube serves up something interesting in their suggestion feed. And it was this tune by Martin Miller, which came out earlier, I guess came out last week. And Martin Miller, I'd never heard of in my freaking life, but he is a guitar player from Leipzig, Deutschland. All right, didn't know that. And he's pretty prominent, I guess, amongst guitar. He's a young guy, but he's a real freaking prodigy. So he's a teacher, and I think he's got like books out and YouTube stuff and whatever. And of course, he's also a songwriter, right? And so he's released this new tune, called Something New, which is why I said I was just listening to Something New, which I was literally and literally and figuratively. <laughs> and it's freaking cool, man. This is, you know, if you are into Joe Satriani, if you are into Steve Vai, like this really next level guitar prodigy wankery kind of stuff. I say wankery. I don't mean to sound pejorative. I don't mean to sound like I'm being in some way critical because this dude's an amazing player, but it's that kind of thing. All right. If you've ever listened to Vi Cetriani, these guitar albums, which tend to be instrumental, actually, you get what I'm talking about in terms of what's going on. There's just this virtuosity and there's vocals, though. And I gather it's the first time that Martin Miller has sung on one of his songs. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me that it's not occurred to you to sing with a voice like that? <laughs> I understand that when Big Rec was forming, Ian Thornley didn't want to be the singer in the band. He's like, nah, I'm a guitar player. I'm not really a singer. Ian Thornley's not really a singer. Are you freaking kidding me? Like, how dare you walk around with a voice like that and not be singing? You know, I sing once in a while. Uh, with the Ken the Zen thing and whatever, when we do our little cover band, our dog and pony show. And I try my best to sing and I sing okay. But these guys are singers and you should be freaking singing. And so Martin Miller sings on this tune called Something New. And it's just really cool, man. I, I do not normally go into or go in for guitar prodigy stuff. And let's be real. This song is a lot about the guitar work, 
but it's a prog song, all right? Somebody in the comments described it better than I could, saying it's a mix of Toto and Dream Theater. <laughs> so if you can imagine Dream Theater's technicality, this kind of prog, some time changes, really intricate drumming, really intricate guitar work, bass, and electric guitar. And then this guy singing over top of it, Martin Miller. There's a lot of synth in this. It's very throwback. And I think that's where the Toto thing comes in because it's, it's very retro sounding, at least in terms of the synths. And for me, it sounded very much like a CCM song. That is Christian contemporary music. <laughs> Don't hide. That's a sound, all right? I don't, can't really quantify or describe what that sound is, but I know it when I hear it. It's in the vocals. It's in the chord progressions. I think there's probably like a major chord progression happening, and it lifts up. That seemed to be an idiosyncrasy of Christian contemporary music back in the day. Don't know if it still is. Synths, clean vocals, ascending major score, major chord runs. Sounded for all the world like a Christian contemporary song from 1989 to me for a band that was not necessarily metal, which means I probably didn't dig it that much. You know, for a rock band, a lot of synth wasn't my bag back in the day. I wanted just guitars, but then there's like a heavy undertone to this too, because it's a guitar prodigy song. And so it's a little bit heavy in spots, a little bit synthy in spots, like really kind of uplifting inspirational sounding and these clean vocals over top that is christian contemporary music of the late 80s faux show i don't think this is a christian song i don't think martin miller is a christian artist but that's a hundred percent the overtone that i got from it and that's a very specific reference from a very specific time and there are perhaps not a lot of people in my audience who recognize it but if you go and listen to this tune and i recommend that you do something new by martin miller for all you guitar people, all you people who really dig on like the heavy duty guitar soloing stuff, check this cat out, man, because the dude rips. He is a player and it's a cool song. Like I like the chorus. It's upbeat. It kind of rocks. You know, it's inspirational sounding. And I dig the older I get, the more I dig that kind of sound in ways that I didn't before. You know, when I was a kid, I was very focused in and very pigeonholed on a certain type of music and sound, generally speaking, and that was late 80s hair metal and thrash, okay? Straight up guitars, not a lot of keyboards. Maybe a little bit of keyboards will let you weigh with on a ballad. But for the most part, it had to be like guitar rock and roll. This is that, but it's got that overtone, and I dig it now. Like, I'm getting a lot better at digging that whole vibe. And this is a cool song, and I don't have a lot of depth. I don't have a lot to say about it. That's in depth because I just heard it for the first freaking time. And I have not heard anything else that this cat has done. But apparently he's releasing an album. It's the first time he's sung on it. He's got a great voice. And who knew? Who knew that YouTube would serve that up to me today and turn that into half an hour of freaking content? The thing is, you know, you can be a guitar prodigy and like a world-class player like Martin Miller and you can drop that tune and you can expect a ripple to go through the guitar community, but that ripple is totally drowned out by the tidal wave and tsunami of a new song by Extreme. <laughs> and if you're in the guitar world, you know what I'm talking about, because a new song by Extreme means a new song by Nuno Betancourt. And while Martin Miller may be extraordinary and a prodigy, Nuno Betancourt is a freaking legend all right nuno betancourt gets mentioned in the same breath as players like eddie van halen and joe satriani etc all right nuno is a freaking legend and martin miller might be one one day all right he's got that in his game as far as i can freaking tell i ain't no guitar player i know enough chords to get through a poison song a ballad you know what i mean around a campfire new extreme now, I was never a giant extreme fan. I have not listened much beyond the hits, and they had them, all right? Late 80s into the early 90s, extreme had some major hits, and it's not just more than words, okay? But the lingering thing with extreme, there are two. 
One is Nuno Betancourt, who was criminally underused by Rihanna (laughs) in that Super Bowl halftime show, if you managed to get through it. Not a big fan of the Super Bowl halftime show. All right, I'm a straight up rock and roll guy mostly. I don't need to see 8 million dancers on the field. All right, some of the optics are cool. Some of the visuals are cool. And I'm just not a pop guy, and so much of it these days is pop. Not really my freaking bag, okay? Nuno was playing with Rihanna, and I think he hit three or four chords, and that was it. And anybody who's watching didn't even notice, and I don't even think he was plugged in. Probably a lot of those people had no idea that they were in the presence of guitar all-time greatness. But if they go and watch the video for Rise by Extreme, they will recognize it, okay? And it's almost like Nuno is almost too good. Nuno is almost too good to make Extreme a band in a weird way because so much of the hype around this song and so much of the reaction to this song is about Nuno Betancourt's guitar playing. You know, Eddie Van Halen with his insane innovation and virtuosity, had a counterbalance to that in the form of Mr. David Lee Roth. (laughs) You can be as spectacular as you like on that axe, but when Dave's doing high kicks with that wild blonde hair, you know, there is a balance. There are two, there are two presences. And then everybody's overlooking the great and immortal Alex Van Halen, who is singular and a freaking dynamite rock and roll drummer, and always was, and Michael Anthony. God love him. What a team player Michael Anthony was. Great bass player, great backup vocals. Very happy to sort of sit behind the two, you know, the unstoppable force and the immovable object in Eddie and Dave. Sit there in between them and let them be, you know. But the the rhythm section was there. It was all there. But you had these two virtuosos out front. The virtuoso frontman, the virtuoso guitar player. There was a balance there. Now, to a certain extent, you get that with Nuno Betancourt and Gary Cherone, all right? But, and, you know, it's not lost on me, the Van Halen connection to Gary Cherone. Gary Cherone is great. Great singer, great performer. I don't know if he gets the right amount of attention. Maybe he does. Like, I'm just kind of pulling this out of my ass. But it just seems to me that this new, all the hype around this new song is not about Gary Cherone singing necessarily or anybody else, but about Nuno Betancourt's guitar playing. And that's not necessarily a bad or unwarranted thing. When it comes to the guitar solo on this song, you just, your jaw freaking drops. It really, really does. Even if you're not into guitar wankery, even if you're into more of a Ty Tabor style, which is so emotional and so kind of built it's like it's not just straight up power shredding it's got texture to it that's singularly tie you know that's what he does not to say that there's that this guitar solo by nuno is just straight up pounding shredding like i once saw zach wilde play live and i think it was maybe no it was just a straight up solo zach wilde show i had a couple of musicians with him and he was playing acoustically from his book of shadows record which is great He's mostly playing acoustic guitar, and every song, Zach Wilde just shredded on that acoustic guitar. Just 64th notes, man, just banging them. And to do that on an acoustic guitar, seems to me you really got to pick every freaking note, right? Like, there's no hammer-ons. Maybe there are. Not as easy as on an electric guitar. And so his right hand, his strumming hand, is just a blur. And he's pounding those notes like it was percussive. It felt like you'd been in the freaking ring. You know what I mean? I don't know how much texture or nuance there was to some of that playing. I just remember being pulverized by an acoustic guitar. I mean, that's Zach Wilde's style, right? Just flaming right in your face. Whoosh. It's awesome. It's amazing. And it's exhausting. It's pulverizing, you know? And... So Nuno has, of course, nuance and style and thought in his playing. I'm not saying he doesn't. But this song, they're kind of coming out at you with the electric fingers, right? The flying fingers. And there's actually a percussive section at the end of the guitar solo, which is, like, incredible. But it's very virtuotic. Virtuotic. Virtue. 
It's a lot of virtuosity happening. All right. That's all I'm saying. And the reaction seems to be all about what an amazing player Nuno is, and he is. What amazing tone he has, and he does. But it seems to overshadow the song itself. And I think the song is pretty freaking cool. All right. Again, never been the biggest extreme fan. I do like extreme. I just haven't dug very deeply into their catalog. But when the song opens, like a cool riff, makes me think of something by perhaps Velvet Revolver. If anybody out there was into Velvet Revolver, it sounds like maybe something they might have come up with. Very modern sounding, all right? And some great vocal harmonies. Gary Trump's got a great voice and always did. I think it was unfortunate what happened to him in Van Halen, you know, because the Hagar years ended and a lot of people who were Van Halen fans were just desperate for Dave. Like, please bring back Dave. It's all we've wanted since 1985 is to see Dave back in Van Halen. So it didn't really matter who might have stepped into Van Halen at that point. If the people wanted Dave, nobody was going to be able to compare. As good as Gary Cherone was, and a lot of people say his contributions to that record they made and his presence in that band made them really, really good. But people just didn't want it. People wanted Dave. And eventually they got Dave. Or a reasonable hand-drawn facsimile of Dave. <laughs> And I love David Lee Roth. I love his freaking podcast. And Van Halen, to me, is Van Halen with David Lee Roth. Do not get me wrong. But I think Gary stepped into an unwinnable situation there, you know? That was Manchester United going into Liverpool, I guess. Having said all that, I think this is a cool song, Rise by Extreme. Yes, amazing guitar work, but great tones. And it freaking rocks, man. It rocks. And it is great, you know, 30 years later to see one of these bands that was, you know, peaking that scene back in the day. Extreme had a weird window. I think their first record was 1989, as I have discussed in the past on this program. While the hair metal thing, the glam metal thing, the 80s rock thing may have persisted into around 1992. I've already made the case that it was beginning to end by 89, and that's when Extreme comes into it. You know, they're one of those bands that had a brief run, but had they come along a little bit earlier, may have had a much longer and much even perhaps bigger run, because they're that good. They are that good. But they are also a band that kind of, I think, stands alone in a weird way. They were of that scene, but not really the same as your typical glam metal band. They weren't really that. There are other bands who are of that variety as well. I think King's X qualifies as that, that were in that scene, but not necessarily exactly stereotypically of that scene. And there's one of, they're one of those bands like Jackal, one of those bands like maybe even Slaughter, who came along towards the end of the scene, Love Hate maybe is the, the best example, that were really freaking good. And had a brief window, but it was too late. And I think Extreme got caught up in that, even though they could have stood out in a singular kind of way because they are a unique band. But if you're going to go into the mid-90s and your selling point is a virtuoso guitar player shredding, ain't going to work, man. Just ain't going to work in the lands of Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, etc. And the sound had just changed. The sound had just changed. And so Extreme would perhaps have had to change their sound too. And that's too bad, but that's just the way it goes, man. But now they're back 30 years later, and they're still rocking. They are rocking freaking hard, and it's a cool song, and it bodes well for this album that they're going to release, and a lot of people are excited about it. And it's cool. You know, I get sent regularly hard rock songs, metal songs, by new bands that are coming out that have that kind of vintage vibe. And it's cool to see bands from that era coming back in around now, still rocking hard, still carrying that flame. And you think of bands like Metallica, who also released another new song, and we'll talk about it, and Iron Maiden, and, you know, Striper has come back in the past 10 years, really rocking hard. And these bands are still carrying the flag, man. And these younger bands are seeing that. Think of Ghost. Think of all these bands that are influenced by these guys from the past, and then these guys from the past coming back in, still laying it down, 
still playing great. I have not heard most of the Skid Row record, but by all accounts, great. I have trouble still. Skid Row without Sebastian Bach. Let's not open up that can of worms. I find it cool. Tesla is still around making great music. I hear rumors of Mr. Big coming back. We'll see. I think it's cool. And I think Extreme has an interesting opportunity here to have a renaissance, have a resurgence. And you hope, you know, if you're like me, you hope that a band like Extreme returning and getting a lot of attention and doing really well and still at the peak of their game. And you see the tour from, you know, last year, the Def Leppard crew, Poison, Joan Jet thing. It's like there is a renewal of interest around some of these bands and around some of that music. I'm hearing younger bands beginning to play that kind of music. And you kind of hope maybe some of those other bands from back in the day might see this, dust off the instruments, because, hey, they're probably all retired from their day jobs now. (laughs) Come back and give it another shot. You know, maybe there's going to be a resurgence, a rise, dare I say it, of some of these bands coming back in and making really good music. And it could be really fun, you know? And maybe Extreme is part of that. Maybe they are in the vanguard of that. But if you have not heard the new Extreme song, Rise, especially if you were an Extreme fan, go check that out, man. And yeah, there's another new Metallica song, If Darkness Had a Sun. That's, I think, the third single from the upcoming 72 Seasons record. I liked Lux Eterna. And then there was the second one, Suicide Something or Other, uh, which I thought was cool, but didn't really stick with me. Now we've got If Darkness Had a Sun. And if I'm Metallica, I'm not, just so you're not confused. I'm not Metallica, but if I was, this is the song that opens the show for me on the next tour. Just got that kind of vibe. All right, it's a very simple chugging riff. Very, very Metallica, like something from the Black Album, maybe. Metallica has an interesting ability to turn a chugging riff into something musical, but then drop a lead guitar hook on top of it that is just so catchy. This new song, If Darkness Had a Sun, is like that, but it opens up in a very recognizable way. And it's a long intro, so you can imagine house lights dropping and 50,000 people losing their freaking minds. And then maybe a light of some sort, and then this riff coming in. And it's a new song, and everybody knows it. But by the time, you know, they're going out to see the show, they're familiar with it. It's a long intro. It's freaking heavy. It's chugging. It's so Metallica. And I can just hear the people, the place going nuts. <laughs> this would be a great show opener. And it's just a simple song. You know, simple riffs. Not an easy riff, but a simple one. Easy to understand, deep, deep, deep groove, deep groove, and James just singing his heart out. You know, there was a moment in the last year or two, this is very popular on YouTube, where James Hetfield on stage just kind of began to confess, I don't know how much longer I can do this, gang. I'm getting older, this music is demanding, it's physical, takes a lot out of you, and I don't know how much longer I can do it. And you know, people began to freak out. Like, is Metallica going to break up? It's hard for people who've been around since the early 80s to imagine a world without Metallica. Even if you're not the most giant Metallica fan, which I never have been, although I do own some records, and I certainly appreciate Metallica, imagining a world without Metallica is very, very strange. (laughs) Strange to me, and people started to freak out about that, but you hear James singing on this record, singing his heart out. His voice sounds freaking fabulous. We'll see what it's like live. It's difficult live. You know, touring takes it out of your voice, especially if you're singing night after night after night. You'll see a lot of these older bands really scheduling time off, you know, two, three days off between shows. And I think that's largely about just resting the singer's voice. And in the case of Metallica, because that music is so physically demanding, it's probably resting everybody's fingers, everybody's feet their backs, whatever, but the voice in particular. But James sounds great on this. You know, nobody does anguish and anger quite like James Hetfield does. And then you hear a guitar solo that you just know is Kirk Hammett. You know, he has a signature sound and vibe about what he's doing too. And this album is raising a lot of excitement. 
you know, Metallica has been bagged on and bagged on and bagged on ever since, probably ever since Load. I mean, that's that's where the style changed and they went all commercial and they cut their hair and stuff. They cut their hair. They've been bagged on, you know, St. Anger, the snare drum sound, which is still a meme and whatever. And then it's very, very difficult for a band who had a certain sound and style to change that style in ways that the fans don't like and then come back to that style and do it well. I have observed this with other bands throughout my long career as a music consumer. I've seen bands come out and play a certain way, shift to a different way, and then try to go back, and it never quite works. And I think Metallica's been caught in that trap a lot of the time. But I think they've been back to trying to thrash long enough that it's beginning to feel right again. And I think there's a lot of buzz around this record because Lux Eterna smokes, you know, great song. This one is heavy. I think people are really appreciating maybe the sound that's coming out on this record. And I think they're also beginning to appreciate in ways that maybe they haven't before Metallica just as an entity. It's been 40 years of this band just crushing, man. Going to heights that few, if any, bands ever have. And they have been like religion for some people, you know? And I think there's a sense around this album that it's not just about this album, as good as the songs may be, as good as they sound, it's just an appreciation for Metallica more generally. And let me lead the chorus that says the next Super Bowl halftime show should be Metallica actually playing real instruments. So go listen to If Darkness Had a Son. Go listen to Rise by Extreme. Go listen to Martin Miller playing something new. I will put all of those songs if I can, on the John Huff podcast referenced on the podcast 2023 playlist. I haven't put a lot on there because I haven't been talking about a lot of music. I'm going to say, go listen to Robin McCauley's new record. Robin McCauley! I was going to do most of the episode, (laughs) actually, about Robin McCauley's new record. And if you remember back a couple years ago, the album Du Yar was... Black Swan. The album was Shake the World in 2020. And that was kind of our album of the year (laughs) that year, kids. And that was Robin McCauley with Jeff Pilsen and Reb Beach and Matt Starr, the drummer, plays with Ace Freely, among others. And that was like a super group that came out with Robin McCauley on vocals. And they released this album called Shake the World, which just freaking rocked. I mean, it was a throwback to the late 80s, early 90s you know, glam metal sound, but very modern, very updated. And Robin McCauley's a miracle. (laughs) Robin McCauley at now 70 years old, singing like he did when he was with MSG back in 1990. You know what I mean? Still sounds the same. And it's not studio tricks. I've seen live footage of this guy just belting. And how do you do it? You know, I want Robin on this program so I can freaking ask him. Robin McCauley's great. His new record sounds very much to me like the Black Swan record, okay? So if you dug that, if you dug the Black Swan record that we talked about, you will like Alive by Robin McCauley, okay? Because the dude is still, this is two years after that, three years after that, it has not deteriorated. The voice is still there, and he's been prolific. Black Swan did another record. I have not dove, dived deeply into that one yet, but I will sooner or later. And he's appeared on some other stuff. So he's still singing. You know, he and Doug Pinnock of King's X, 70 years old, out there, prolific. You know, just playing, making records with people, doing the thing. You know, getting it in. Well, they still can. Both still sound great. Robin McCauley is a miracle, man. He's a freaking miracle. And his record, Alive, again, if you dug the Black Swan record, you like this one. So I'm hearing some docking in some of the guitar work, I'm hearing actually, (laughs) if you can believe it, there's a tune called, I think, Stronger Than Before, which sounded like Megadeth to me. The intro. The intro sounded a little bit like Megadeth to me. I'm hearing some Tesla. There's a tune called Feel Like Hell, and when that one starts, I'm like, it's Rammstein. (laughs) Sounds like Rammstein to me. So this is not a 70-year-old former hard rocker who's mellowing with age. 
All right. He is incorporating some modern sounds, modern tunings like Rammstein and bringing that intensity. And he's rocking. I mean, this is a rocking album. I'm hearing a lot of Queensryche. There's a tune called The Endless Smile. There's a tune called Who I Am. They both, to me, sound like something maybe from the Empire Records. So, you know, you're getting that throwback sound, but you're also getting modern sounds and modern influences mixed in. And at the end of the day, you have got Robin McCauley singing over top of this, his freaking lungs out, and he sounds amazing. He sounds just freaking terrific. I don't know what my favorite song is. I've been through this record several times and I like it. Dead as a Bone, maybe. Bless Me Father. Go listen to the whole thing. I'll put something on the playlist. You can scope it out. There's a video, I think, for the title track Alive on YouTube. You can go check that out. If you've not listened to Robin McCauley's work with Michael Shanker back in the day on the MSG records, really, really great. Like, really, really good records of that era. All right, and you know, Michael Schenker is a freaking legend. One of my favorite songs of the glam era is Love Is Not a Game by MSG. Probably top three, top five. You know, I I said when I played this game a couple of years ago that Don't Stop Running by YT is my favorite song of the whole freaking era. Love Is Not a Game is in that conversation. And that's Robin McCauley. And he sounds the same. He sounds the same then as he does now. If anything, now. His voice has taken on a little bit more texture, so there's like more grit in it. Freaking great. Go listen to Robin McCauley's Alive. I thought I'd get maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> Here we are, and I haven't even done the Patreon plug. Yes, if you've made it this far, then perhaps you enjoy what I'm doing. And if you do, you might be inclined to join us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast, where for the low, low price of $5 a month, you can support the show. Think of it as tipping me a buck 25 for every episode that I do. If, if we was out at the club, you would buy me a drink. Or if we were at the cafe dressed like beatniks, you would buy me a cup of coffee. As a token of appreciation for the work I'm putting into this program and have been low these 130 plus episodes, if you would be inclined to tip your hat in that way to me. You can do so via Patreon, patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast, $5 a month. And it helps me keep the show going. It helps me cover my expenses. You know, I would like to grow. I would like to expand. Having that behind me helps. And it saves me having to do ad reads, sponsorship reads, that kind of stuff. I would like to keep that out of the freaking show. So if you would support that, you might consider supporting me over on Patreon. You can, if you don't want to do that, it's fine. Totally fine. Share these episodes, please. Share with your friends. Follow me on Instagram, John Huff Podcast, Facebook, John Huff Podcast, TikTok for now, John Huff Podcast. If you like what I'm doing and you think other people might like it as well, if you are being inspired, educated, entertained, informed, if you like hearing a friendly voice once a week, if it warms your cockles, and you think it might warm other people's cockles too, please consider just sharing these episodes and telling them about it, man. I appreciate so much the support that has come my way over the past few years. I do appreciate it. We are sneaking up on an anniversary. I have to check my timelines. I think it's been four years very, very soon. I'll look into that. We'll talk about it later. For now, I'm going to go because I got to rest my back. I was going to do a whole thing about my back too, and this persists. Hopefully by next week, it'll be over. We'll see, man. In the meantime, go listen to some good music. Let me know what you're listening to. You know, Drop me a line. Let me know what you're digging about the program. Let, let me know what you might like me to address. If you're encountering new music, I want to hear about it. If you're playing new music, I want to hear about it, okay? In the meantime, please do take care of yourself. So I'm going to shut up, shutting up, and hey! I'll check you later. Yeah. I was going to attempt to sing Love Is Not A Game by MSG, but who are we fooling, man? I can't sing 70-year-old Robin McCauley. Good luck with 40-year-old Robin McCauley. You know what I mean? Go listen for yourself. Freaking great.